to have. It's not as fancy as uh, Debbie Beasley's, but this is a bicycle bell off of my wife's uh, bike. So let's see if you can all hear it here. Lovely, perhaps, for all of you. Let's uh, get started. I'm excited about today's meeting. It's fun to be back uh, in the seat here to uh, to take you all through the meeting as the past Life is a bit more relaxed nowadays for me, but it's it's great to see you all. Um, today's uh, speaker, I think, should be excellent, talking about what we're doing this summer and bicycling in the city of Denver is certain something that uh, that I love to do with my kids and family, but it is can, can be a little bit precarious sometimes. So it'd be great to hear more about that. We also have two new members to be introduced today. And if you've got some good news, as I know many of you do, please start thinking about what you can share with the club because we do have good news buckets today. So think about that. But to, uh, to start things off as we, uh, as we normally do, let's start with our Pledge of Allegiance. And you all will stay muted while I say it, but I encourage you to uh, put your hand on your heart and say it along with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Our inspirational moment today will be done by our uh, co-vice president of service, Lisa Goulias, who is a land specialist, if you're curious about investing in land and how that can work, uh, with Velour Enterprises. So Lisa, I saw you there somewhere and hopefully you can get yourself unmuted and inspire us with something. All right, hopefully you can hear me, yes. I can hear you, I assume everybody can, thank you. Wonderful, okay, hang on just one second. All right, and this was a decision that I made before I knew who our speaker was today. Um, this is an analogy of bicycles and life. It's the little things that make us happy. For me, that's my bike. A bike ride can seem like flying. When we first learn to ride a bike and fall off, we hear a voice, get back on. Learn to balance, steady the handlebars, head up and look in the direction you are going keep moving after we learn how to ride now we're cruising feels like we're flying we might cruise the same block 15 20 times little by little we move outside our comfort zone we ride two maybe three miles as we get older we go further and further mapping out a 20 mile ride avoiding obstacles such as a sudden reaction to circumvent the person who jumped right on our path or we decide to run them over. Then we find ourselves on the incline of life. The goal to reach the top seems much slower than we thought and it takes more effort. We may change gears, take a detour, perhaps the path may be longer, but it's a switch back with less incline. We will sweat, our heart rate will go up, and every pedal takes more effort. We wonder if we'll ever make it. There are times we ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Suddenly remember the voice, keep moving. Victory, we made it to the top. Now we get to cruise again, all the way down, we are flying. Thank you, Lisa. That was fun. I enjoyed that. And I think it's something I need to share with my kids about keeping balance in their lives by keeping moving in the metaphor of a bicycle. Well, I'm curious what people, I sometimes you see people at the stoplights on their bicycle, these pros who can sit there and balance without moving. I wonder what, how they would feel if they're in some sort of Zen moment in their lives that we can all aspire to. Uh, next week, but thank you, Lisa. That was great. I appreciate it. Uh, we have our secretary's report next. Uh, Troy Shemansky, an investment counselor, our new secretary this year, who has many times of practice. Troy, what do you have for us today for our announcements? Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, first, we're gonna welcome our guests. So we'd like to welcome Rich Warren, who's a potential new member and guest of Melly Kennard, as well as Stuart Zoll, who is also a potential new member. Also, welcome to any other guests that we might have missed. Some birthdays this week. Happy birthday to Jim McGivney and Bill Imig, 
today and then Bill West later on in the week. So wish them a happy birthday if you can. On to some announcements. Uh, please note our Rotary Happy Hour that was scheduled to take place this evening is canceled and we will resume our normal schedule next week on August 20th. So please make a note of that. We'd love to have you there. Important dates coming up. Don't forget to register for Darlene's retirement party on Wednesday, August 19th from 6 to 8.30 at the Scientific Sod Farm in Commerce City. Reservations are due tomorrow at 4 p.m. So you can wait until tomorrow uh, like I normally would or take care of it right now if you plan to be there. Please join us this Saturday for our quarterly Cherry Creek Trail cleanup. As you all know, the club adopted part of the Cherry Creek Trail and made a commitment to keep it clean from trash and debris. Currently, we only have eight of the 20 volunteers needed to register. Please see our meeting recap email immediately following this meeting or reach out to Chair Andrew Walker. Finally, we have the Peach Pickup Day is Saturday, September 12th from 8 a.m. to noon only at the Rotary Office parking lot. Don't forget to order your Colorado peaches. Jim, that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Troy. Very well done. Very well done. So next we have our new member introductions. And uh, this is a great time for us to welcome a couple new people to our club and uh, to do the best we can, especially with the, uh, the world of Zoom environments and COVID, to get to know them and, and welcome them to the club. But I've seen that both... Um, our, our new folks are with us today, so I'm glad to have your attendance, and I am going to turn things over to uh, Colleen Kozad, who is a member of our board of directors, and she's also a real estate broker with Bradford Real Estate, co-sponsor of Debbie Wilkins to start. Right, thank you very much, Jim. Hi, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to announce Debbie Wilkins. She is a, also a realtor with Compass. Um, and also, I, I wanted to mention that she does plan to be at Darlene's party next week. So please reach out or find her and say hello and introduce yourself. And without further ado, Debbie, please tell us a little bit about yourself. And welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to getting to know everyone. Um, I'm originally from St. Louis and went to high school and college in Atlanta, University of Georgia moved to Dallas for about a year and a half and I've been and then back to St. Louis and my daughter my mom lived in Cherry Creek for 22 years my daughter moved out four years ago so my husband and I moved out part-time about two and a half years ago and we are currently full-time for sure for the next four months but while well, he can't move but we just moved in to a house in West Highlands um, back in St. Louis I had I have four dogs, a crazy dog person, and I was a member of a therapy dog program is what I did a lot of work with and looking forward to finding opportunities here. I'm going to start with Wynn and mentor um, a junior at Lincoln High School, so I'm looking forward to that and just looking forward to getting to know more people in the community and helping out. Excellent, Debbie. That is that is awesome. And uh, it's great to hear that you're already getting involved in Rotary with the mentoring and what you've done in the past with working with dogs to train them is something at least a couple other, maybe two or three people in Rotary have done before. And we also have Andre, who is a uh, user of a dog who's been trained for just those purposes as a member of the club. So that's awesome. That's great. Thank you for being Thank part you. of Denver Rotary. Absolutely. Um, Let's. We, a second person we're introducing today is part of our, a different membership type, uh, Rotary Strategic Partnership, and it's the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. And we have past club president Steve Mast, uh, who is going to tell us more about our new member, Robert Cross. Steve? Thank you. Thank you, past president, Jim. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to both sponsor and introduce Robert Cross today as the newest member of the Denver Rotary Club. Robert is a senior membership representative for the Denver Metro Chamber. He's been with the Chamber for five years. Um, his focus is on building Chamber membership with new member acquisitions and retention by keeping current members involved. Robert's prior experience has been focused on our downtown community. He was with the Downtown Denver Partnership, 
in the downtown Denver Business Improvement District. So he's got a very good understanding of the Denver business community. Robert received his BSBA in marketing from the University of Minnesota, Missouri. He's been in Denver for seven years and seems to have gotten fairly acclimated. He enjoys skiing, fishing, hiking, and camping, as well as golfing. Denver Rotary, as you mentioned, Jim, and the Denver Chamber have similar interests in the Denver community. So in order to promote that interest and broaden both of our organizations' visibility and presence, we formed this strategic partnership between our two organizations. So Robert will represent uh, the Chamber and our club, and I'll represent our club with the Chamber. Uh, Denver Rotary, please join me in a in a safely distanced welcome to Robert Cross, our newest member. And Robert, if you wouldn't mind sort of expanding on the chamber and uh, making some com comments, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, that, was a, that was a kind introduction. I don't even know if I have to give too much in more introduction about myself there. But uh, let me give you guys a little background about the chamber, just a better understanding if you guys haven't been involved before. Uh, the Denver Metro Chamber, or chambers in general, are going to be nonprofit organizations. We are member based, uh, and our membership is the business community. So, our goal is to support the business community in any way possible. We do that through networking events, we have uh, small business development training programs, uh, committees and councils that focus on specific industry clusters. And then we also have a, a department that, that works in economic development. So seems like a lot, uh, and I'll break that down for you. So our membership, uh, the Denver Metro Chamber, we cover the entire metro region. So we do have a, a large, uh, expansive membership, around 3,000 members. I would say 75% of that membership is gonna be small businesses. And what we consider a small business is 100 employees or less. That other 20 to 25% is going to be, you know, these larger companies that hire a lot of employees and are going to be industry specific within the Denver metro region, but also anybody that really does commerce in the city of Denver or the surrounding areas. So how we reach all our membership is going to be through four affiliate companies. And the chamber is going to think of the chamber as sort of the umbrella company to these four affiliates. So the four, the four affiliates are going to be our small business development center. Uh, their main focus is providing training programs and free consultation for small business owners. So for any of you guys, those consultants are completely free. Uh, and they're great to go get resources if it's seeing an attorney, uh, business strategy, marketing strategy. Um, like I said, they're completely free for anybody in the community that has a small business or is thinking about uh, starting their own company. They also provide training programs that can be for that are for small business owners. And currently, um, we've been really focused on COVID lately and uh, how small businesses are functioning during this time. Uh, so that is our first affiliate. Our second affiliate is going to be our leadership foundation. And the Leadership Foundation provides leadership programming. It can be a two-day crash course of the Denver economy up to a year-long intensive program. Uh, and these, these programs are for people that have just started their career up to the C-level employee. So it, our, our sort of vision with that affiliate of the Chamber is if we can interconnect nonprofits, the public sector, the private sector, and leadership development, you know, they're there to network amongst themselves and hopefully meet new contacts to help grow our economy. And then our final two affiliates are going to be for our, you know, larger companies that we have as members at the chamber. These, uh, one of those affiliates is called C3, that stands for Colorado Competitive Council. Their main focus is policy and legislation on the local, state, and federal level. Uh, and they deal with specific uh, policy that will affect the business community. So we, we, get, uh, we have lobbyists at the chamber. They're at the Capitol building on a, on a daily basis during the session. And they're pretty much supporting the business community in any way possible. If it's going to be legislation that could promote commerce or if it would be negatively um, against us. And then our final affiliate is going to be our Economic Development Corporation. Their main focus is bringing business to Colorado. So they focus on key industries that are predominantly hire a lot of employees in Colorado. 
some of these industries can be aviation, aerospace, healthcare, education, uh, energy. And by promoting these industries and growing these industries, we, we look to attract businesses to Colorado. So we do a lot of data research through that affiliate. And with that affiliate, companies can come to us if they're looking to move a business or a headquarters to Colorado, and we can give them all the proper information to make that decision. And by attracting companies, we're pretty much, the Chamber's overall goal is to create job growth. And through these four affiliates is sort of our initiatives that we've come across. Um, and I will put my contact information in the chat. And if any of you guys would like to be like a one on one with me, I'd be happy to talk further about the chamber uh, and, you know, what we do and how we sort of, you know, work with the business community. And then uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, Steve covered a lot there, but I'm uh, originally from Texas, from Dallas, Texas. I went to school in Missouri. I did about a year stint after school in New Orleans and then moved up to Denver seven. It's almost going to eight years ago now. Uh, actually, here in August, it is eight years. So I've been with the Chamber five years. I was working with um, another organization called the Downtown Denver Partnership prior to that that does a lot of the same work the Chamber does. And, you know, as any Coloradan, uh, I love skiing, fishing, hiking, drinking beers on the top of mountains. So uh, it's nice to meet you all. And uh, again, I'll put my inform information in that chat down below and feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to do one-on-ones. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Outstanding. Do, Robert, do you prefer to go by Robert or Rob or Bob or? You know, uh, Robert, uh, Rob is totally fine. I, uh, yeah, okay. in my office, there was like, uh, there was already a Rob. So like, I had to, I, you know, I switched my name to Robert as an official, but uh, either or Robert or Rob works for me. Gotcha. In Rotary, you get to choose your name. So, uh, all right, Rob. Very good. Well, it is my honor as the immediate past president and as a board member of the Rotary Club of Denver to welcome you, Debbie Wilkins, and Rob Cross to Rotary. Uh, you've been invited to join and been accepted by the membership and the board of directors uh, to the Rotary Club of Denver to become a member of the most prestigious service organization in the world, Rotary International. You were selected because you and we Rotarians hold in common the humanitarian values of service, leadership, integrity, fellowship, and diversity. We invite you to engage in service opportunities to connect with fellow Rotarians in our club and beyond in order to promote peace, understanding, and to help us grow our club. By embracing these values, we're confident that you will discover the true essence of Rotarians, service above self. Thank you, Colleen and Steve, for inviting and inspiring Debbie and Rob. And thank you, Debbie and Rob, for joining us. Uh, fellow Rotarians, please help me in welcoming our newest members. Normally, we would stand and give you a, uh, an ovation, but now maybe we can do something more virtual and, uh, and clap to welcome you into the club. But uh, Debbie Wilkins, uh, Robert Cross, uh, thank you for joining us. We look forward to getting to know you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next, as promised, we have an opportunity for good news. And uh, Harriet Downer is going to take us through the good news buckets. And Harriet, I thought I had some good news this morning that I could kick things off. I was out doing my normal morning um, routine uh, with a big bowl of soapy water and I go around each of my trees and my bushes to collect Japanese beetles. I don't know if anyone else has that routine. Um, and by the way, everybody, I'm buying time a little bit so you can raise your hands in the room or otherwise and let Harriet know when you have some good news. Uh, I'll let you talk about the money, Harriet. Um, but I, I looked at my apple trees, my cherry trees, my plum tree, and I didn't, I found maybe one or two Japanese beetles. I thought we were through the season, but then I made it over to my rose bushes and I found about 40 or 50 of them. So, um, so though I don't have good news, but I almost have good news about the Japanese beetles. And now Harriet, who is a trustee with the Denver Rotary Club Foundation, longtime member of the club, uh, also somebody who is a software and education with logical connections, the business that you are owner of. Um, Harriet, take us through the good news buckets for today. Tim, thank you very much, and sorry about the beetles. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. they found a new source, <laughs> new food right. supply. Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody to the good news or red bucket, depending, I don't have my red bucket with me, but I have an incentive. I have the beginnings of donations. 
Um, this is an opportunity to donate a minimum of $20 donation to our Denver Rotary Club Foundation for the worthy causes that we do every year, World Community Service, international and local projects. We work with our high school interact club to do junior achievement programs, um, college counseling, high school scholarships, many worthy causes. So uh, I will put the donation link in the chat when we're over, but who has good news? You can raise your hand virtually on the screen or via um, Harry, you see that uh, Kevin Shelley has got his virtual hand up, followed by Rick. All right. Well, I was about to click on Ian. So, Kevin, okay. please unmute yourself, and Kevin will let you go first. Thanks, Harry. I appreciate that. Um, the good news that I have, guys, is uh, many of you may or may not know, but I am co-chairing with Brian Geis and obviously working with Harriet and Jill on the peach sale and, and many, many others. But the good news that I have right now is kind of good news, kind of not. I have decided that every week I will be giving $20 for good news if we are not beating Brian Geis's uh, peach sales that he did last year. So this is my challenge to everybody here on the call today. Help me save my money. Let's beat what Brian Geis was able to do last year, which we're right around a thousand, a um, uh, little over a thousand uh, peach boxes. We're about 524 now. So I'm making a plea. Get out there, sell some peaches, buy some peaches. If you did one last year, get two. If you did two last year, do four. Help me not go broke and turn the tides on Brian Geis. So thank you, you know, everybody. Kevin, maybe in the chat room, you could just throw a quick link to where people could order peaches right now while they're thinking about it. It's obviously Absolutely. we've got it in our email box, but throw it in the chat room because uh, somebody's going to order during this meeting, I'm sure. Yes. Let's Sorry, Harry, back to you. Let's beat Brian Geis, guys. Let's beat Brian Geis. <laughs> I like that incentive. Rick, I will call on you. Thank you very much, Harry. Yeah, so... Uh, some of you who heard the pre-program chat and had heard that uh, we just spent the last five days with the grandkids and I'm throwing 20 bucks in there because of the recognition that in the midst of this pandemic, which uh, is, is a real, real heavy thing on a lot of folks, we found a marvelous way through, through this camping experience with our grandchildren to, to do some fun together things and uh, we couldn't be more blessed to be in a position to be able to do that and to enjoy that time with our grandkids and uh, it's, a, it's a happy happy thing for us. So 20 bucks in the bucket for me. So. Excellent and do we have anybody else who is interested in donating? Uh, oh come on. I'm not seeing anybody else. Harriet? Harriet, I don't see any virtual hands raised, but oh, Kate, is that you speaking? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't get my hand raised. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, but I just wanted to um, let everyone know that I had uh, my first meeting um, with a committee with the Polio Plus uh, group yesterday. It was lovely. And I look forward um, to working with Peg and the rest of the team on the Rotary Foundation um, and the meeting we have next week. Terrific. Thank you very much, Kate. Chuck, Thank I you, see Kate. your hand raised. Well, mine is to pick up on Kevin. Um, I stumbled on an idea this year from a former Rotarian, Bob Palmer, who some many of you will remember, and he still helps me with Rotary Peaches. He said, why don't we put the peach announcement in our neighborhood newsletter? So we did. And um, my sales are more than I can manage, unfortunately. I, last year I had 35 boxes and I'm at 75 boxes this year with some help. So I would suggest to the people who are on the call, if you have a homeowners association, all I did was forward my standard pitch that I did by email, had that put on the neighborhood website I would say I've probably gotten 15 to 20 boxes off of just that being put on the neighborhood 
uh, website. So I'm happy to contribute $20 uh, just to be able to spread the word to some other people here on the phone call. Oh, Chuck, thank you. That's a terrific idea. Yeah, my association doesn't have a website, but it does have a bulletin board and it's been posted. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was a, uh, we have a uh, newsletter that goes out, and so it, it was beautiful. It went to every, we have about 174 residents, it went to all 174 of them. And Chuck, frankly, it's all the more important is we're not doing a, a, a different big fundraiser uh, in order to get the money that we need to grant out to folks. This peach sale is our, is our big fundraiser right now. So the more that we can get people and non-Rotarians to buy into it makes a huge difference for the club and for our foundation. So thanks for thinking creatively and doing that. So Jim, Jim, just a thought, you know, there are other homeowners associations than what we live in. I don't know how to yeah. do that yet. We can approach it next year, but I think it's a great opportunity for Rotary. Right. You get, you ask more people, you're going to get more sales, period. Right. Excellent. And if you've got a hook to next door, post it on next door. Yeah. All right, Harry, unless you see anybody else, I, we, uh, maybe we should wrap up the good news. Uh, okay. So I will pass George. it back to you. Yeah, excellent. All right. Thank you, Harry. Appreciate you doing that. Thank and you, And those who everybody. shared some good news, I think there'll be a link in the chat room there. You can uh, make your donation to the DRCF, uh, to our foundation. Today's program introduction for our speaker today is going to be done by Rick Luthold, who we heard from earlier today. He is our, uh, our uh, vice president for the club for the team of meetings and events. And he's also the chairman of an engineering firm, Sanderson Stewart. So Rick... Who's speaking to us today? Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it very much. It's my pleasure to introduce you folks to Dana Hoffman today. Uh, Dana's a native here in Denver. She's a certified planner for the uh, city of Denver. Their uh, community design uh, department, Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. I got the pleasure to meet Dana through the work I do with my neighborhood formerly Stapleton, now Central Park. I sit on the United Neighbors Board, and I needed to reach out as part of the traffic committee there and get some information. And, you know, sometimes dealing with uh, city bureaucracy and city employees is not necessarily the most pleasant thing that you have in life. And I have to tell you, Dana has been just, just a, it, it, in the term of the season, a peach to deal with. Dana doesn't know we're selling peaches for uh, fundraising, but she, she is just an exceptional uh, community servant. Uh, she's always there to help. She's always got a smile on, and uh, she has a big heart for our community and the things that go on in it. And she is going to provide us a discussion, as you men mentioned earlier, Jim, about cycling in our community and the good things that are going on there. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dana. Awesome. Hey, thanks for that introduction, Rick, and I am delighted to be here. Uh, it's so exciting to see so many people on the call, and I like all the shout outs for uh, biking already, which is awesome, because that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully that works out for everybody to see. That's good. We can see it. I'm going to make that big. Are you guys seeing the big screen? We are now, yes. We also right. see your notes on the right side of your screen. Yeah, I was afraid of that. I don't know if I can uh, switch those around. My notes aren't that exciting. <laughs> All right. Uh, shoot. That might be a preferences thing with how you look at your thing, but I don't. I don't know how to get into that. Sorry about that, guys. Let me see. Oh, there we go. I think that's the way to do it. All right. Great. Now we see what I think you want us to see on your PowerPoint. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Just a little bit of technical difficulty, pretty standard these days. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about bikes. Uh, you see bikes on the screen. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is not just about riding bikes, but really more about how we make our cities bikeable and uh, more biked. And I use the term bikes specifically to refer to uh, commuting around town. So we're in Colorado, people love to use bikes for recreation. 
Uh, but as a member of the city, I'm really promoting using it for commutes and how we get there. So uh, without further ado, I wanted to jump into a live poll just to keep you on your toes and also to get to know you guys better uh, and how you relate to bikes in Denver. So uh, the question's up on the screen hopefully now. Um, thinking about Denver streets today, how do you feel about bicycling to get to places you need to go? And just choose the answer that feels best for you. It may not just be exactly what you are, but just around that area. Answers are rolling in here. Okay. It's a good mix. All right. So hopefully everyone sees the results now. Interesting. So it looks like a lot of people don't bike on this group, which is a great opportunity for me to talk about it. Uh, a good chunk of people say I can get most places, uh, followed by I bike only a few places. All right, that's really interesting for me. Um, we're going to probably come back to that in just a couple minutes, um, how that relates to people on the whole in Denver. Um, but before I go too much further, I wanted to give just a quick discussion. Disclaimer, so I do work for the City of Denver, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, a very long name, um, but I am sharing some of my own thoughts and opinions today, so I'm not really representing the department, even though I'm talking about a lot of the work that we do. Um, and then while I'm on the subject of disclaimers, I personally am a bike lover, I'm on my bike a lot, so I understand sort of the whole complexity of this issue in our city, um, and a lot of the trade-offs, I do come at it from that angle as a bike lover. Uh, luckily, probably for me, working for the city, uh, Denver is a bike lover as well. So what you're seeing up on the screen is the mayor's mobility action plan. Uh, and a lot of the goals that he has set for our city around transportation involve bikes and require a bike, our city to be more biked in order to achieve them. Um, that's true for the commute goal that you see there. Um, for the 80% reduction in emissions goal. Um, and also it relates to the zero traffic deaths goal. Um, and I'll talk about that a little more in just a couple minutes. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about this plan and uh, where we are as a city is that the city actually has put their money where their mouth is in terms of bikes in the last couple years. So uh, for instance, in 2019, they had a $27 million budget for transportation. Uh, improvements across the city and almost a third of that was dedicated to moving our bike program forward. Uh, so this is a major initiative and it has money behind it. Um, so that gets me to the next question, like why? Why are we spending money on bikes? Why are we trying to promote bikeability? Uh, and one of the key reasons, maybe a little obvious for some, is mobility. Uh, if you've seen the internet, uh, there are often these images floating around, especially amongst transportation nerds. And that's because it really is good at illustrating uh, some of the ideas behind limited space in our right of way and our streets. Um, and you can see that the image on the left with single occupancy vehicles, that's how most of us get around day to day. Um, but unfortunately, they take up a lot of room on the road. And as our cities densify and grow, as Denver has, um, in order to have efficient moving of people, uh, we need to use some of our other modes that efficiently move people. Um, in a smaller amount of space. And bikes are one of those vehicles that we need to use to make our city remain mobile even as it grows. Uh, another reason that I referred to earlier is about safety. Uh, so this is a little less probably intuitive overall, um, but I'll start with our current trends, which is unfortunately in Denver, and this is not significant just to Denver, we're seeing this trend in a lot of major cities. Uh, we have a huge spike in the last decade uh, in five fatalities and also just major traffic incidents. So you can see in the graph on there that we've grown about 16%, and um, that was between uh, 2010 and 2017, and roughly about that same period we had a fatality increase related to traffic of 60, uh, what is it, 61%. Um, so this trend is something that the mayor is really focused on reversing, getting to a zero traffic deaths goal. Um, what's interesting to me about this is that Bikes are actually a huge part of that. So in study after study after study, what we see is that bikes 
when we focus on bikeability in a city and when there are a lot of bikers in a city that actually enhances safety and reduces fatalities, not just for bicyclists, but for everybody on the road. So planning for bikes equals planning for safety, which is an interesting finding. Um, the other, probably a little more obvious benefit uh, for biking is that if we get people biking as their commute mode, probably not right now as much, but when we're getting, going places more again, uh, bikeability uh, is that little bit of uh, exercise built into your day and folks that commute by bike see a whole bunch of health benefits, uh, reduction in cancer, reduction in diabetes, it helps with depression and anxiety. And that's all a benefits before the COVID pandemic and sort of the realization that it is one of our safer virus free ways to get around, uh, as well as sort of a recreational opportunity within our cities. And then last but not least, in terms of benefits, uh, there's the greenhouse gas reduction benefits. So what you're seeing on that pie chart is Denver's greenhouse gas emissions in 2015. And right behind our built infrastructure, the biggest piece of the pie comes from our uh, gas electric, uh, excuse me, our gas vehicles. Uh, and we're gonna have to tackle that from a lot of different angles. So electric vehicles are part of the solution. Transit is probably gonna have to be part of that solution. Um, maybe there's even a part to play with scooters. Um, that's debatable, but what's not debatable is that bikes are part of the solution. Um, and that's, we know that's at least partly true because the average trip distance in Denver is just about three miles, which is pretty perfect as a bikeable distance. So that's another reason. So uh, I don't know if you guys have drank the bike Kool-Aid yet. I'm going to assume for the rest of the presentation that you have. Um, so uh, I'm going to jump into what would be the next obvious question, which is why do people bike or not bike in Denver today? Uh, and you're seeing up here sort of a bar chart. This comes from a survey that was conducted by Dr. Cog, which is our regional transportation agency. And they asked sort of a series of questions that were similar to the live poll that I did earlier. Um, and what we find is that there's sort of a pattern and sort of groupings of people. Um, so uh, this is the overarching uh, sort of breakdown. Uh, what's interesting is Rotary is a little bit different. Um, and I maybe have some theories about what that breakdown is. But I'm gonna go through these really quick to understand where people are in Denver today in relation to biking. So over on the left there, uh, you have the 4% of people, so not very much of the population, who feel highly confident uh, biking. And most of those folks probably look like the gentleman in the top corner, so folks who wear spandex, uh, they're probably a man, uh, and they're probably really confident on the road. It doesn't matter if that road has bike infrastructure, they're willing to go around Denver on almost any roadway we have. Um, and then moving over on the bar graph, you have folks who are somewhat confident. Um, those, I fit pretty solidly into that crowd, so you can see my picture up there. I'm not usually wearing spandex, um, but I do kind of weather the elements. I get out there pretty much every day. Uh, I don't really feel comfortable on a lot of roadways, um, but if it has a bike lane and I can plan my route, I feel pretty comfortable. So I'm in that somewhat confident category, which is just about 12% of us in Denver. Um, and then the vast majority of people, or 60%, fall into what we call the interested but concerned category. Um, and these are people who, um, I think it was something around 40% of you all today on the poll said something in this category where you might bike around just a little bit to go to a neighborhood park. Um, you consider biking, but it doesn't necessarily feel safe right now on the roads. Um, and if you have to plan out a route and it doesn't have bike lanes, you might feel like that kiddo in the picture with the helmet, which I love so much, uh, a little worried. Um, so that's the bulk of folks. Um, and then there are a lot of folks in Denver, about 25% um, when this survey was done, that uh, would fall into no, no way, no how. Um, and that may be because they're older or not able to. Um, I heard a lot about injuries in the discussion um, this morning, knee injuries and that sort of thing. Um, or they just don't appreciate biking. Um, so when we're thinking about our strategy to bring more biking to Denver, um, it's important to understand that Denver's strategy is really focused on that 60% of people. 
Um, the people who are interested in biking, but they really need better facilities to feel comfortable out there. Um, and this is important because we're not really trying to uh, change the minds of people who aren't into biking at all. And we're also not focused on those super highly confident folks who will bike on any road, or even the somewhat confident folks. We're really trying to get people who want to bike but don't feel comfortable to get there, and they need a higher comfort bicycle facility to do it. Uh, which begs the question, what the heck is a high comfort bikeway? That's just sort of some mumbo jumbo term. So I wanted to quickly go through what Denver defines in terms of comfort. Um, and this does depend a little bit on the roadway itself, what is actually going to feel high comfort. But as a general rule, our typical bike lane, what you're seeing on the left, where you just have two striped lanes, that's our minimal bike infrastructure um, that we have out there today. Um, and it does help separate you from vehicles, but are interested and concerned folks what make up most of the city, this isn't enough for them. You're right next to vehicles driving right next to you. It feels uncomfortable. So moving up that uh, sort of comfort level are buffered bike lanes. And you see these around Denver too. They're fairly common at this point. It's just it adds that little bit of a couple foot buffer between the moving vehicles and the bicyclist. Um, it makes it a lot more comfortable. Um, but again, it's probably not a lot enough, especially if you're thinking about uh, biking with kids, um, you're not particularly comfortable on your bike. Um, and that's where we move into what we call a protected bike lane. And protected bike lanes have a vertical element. Basically, that's what we're talking about. So it's a bollard, uh, it could be a curb, it even could be parked vehicles, a parked vehicle lane. And we have just a couple of these. So if you live in central Denver, you might start seeing these. They're in downtown Denver now. Uh, there will be more of them in the future. Um, and then moving up from there, again, is what I call a neighborhood bikeway. And that's just a term uh, that we use specifically. It doesn't mean just a share on the road, which maybe the image is demonstrating. But really, I like to think about it as the road itself actually is prioritizing bicyclists and pedestrians over vehicles, the entire roadway itself. Um, sometimes this means that we're having sort of traffic calming elements, whether that's bollards or knockdowns. Um, that really prioritize that bike or pedestrian experience. Um, and in the most extreme case, it's actually diverting traffic. So I have up here the shared streets, which maybe you've seen on like 11th or 16th in downtown Denver right now under COVID. Um, I would call these a really extreme version of a neighborhood bikeway that are temporary, but uh, demonstrate the intent of, of the neighborhood bikeway as prioritizing that other form of movement besides vehicles on the street. Um, and then the last section is multi-use paths or separated paths. They're really off the street entirely. They feel very comfortable. Um, their downsides is that they are very expensive, usually within our limited right of way. Uh, and also it's hard to get bikes safely on and off of them to get where they need to go. A lot of our bikeways like the Cherry Creek Path, there are only limited locations where you can sort of jump on and off. So that's sort of the, the uh, sequence of bike comfort. I'm going to jump into Denver's specific strategy about how to actually get here. Um, and one of those is just to get more bike lanes on the road. Um, so the mayor had a goal of having 125 miles of new bike lanes, bike infrastructure in a five year period. We're getting towards halfway through that period. So through 2023, we'll have 125 miles if we meet our goals. Um, and then the other key metric here in the long term is to have every Denver citizen within a fourth mile of a higher comfort facility. And we're going to do that sort of in chunks, which we'll talk about in just a second. So what's up on the screen right now is our existing bike network. Um, so what you see is a lot of blue, which are those typical bike lanes. And you also see a lot of green and yellow, which is those separated facilities. Um, what we want to do is introduce everything in between to get that uh, full network and the one fourth mile radius. So this is the ultimate goal of the city. It's pretty aggressive to have all of these new bikeways added. Um, and what you're seeing on this screen is a lot more of those purple dotted lines. Those are the protected bike lanes. Um, and you're also seeing a lot more of those neighborhood bikeways, which are represented by red. Um, so a big shift, a lot of new bike infrastructure that's planned for our streets. Um, and there's two key ways that we're planning to accomplish this. Uh, the first is, like I said, bite-sized network pieces. So uh, the map there is showing some larger scale neighborhoods, not our like uh, specific neighborhoods you might think of where you live, but 
chunks of the city that they're going to prioritize and try to get the whole network in all at once or in a very short time period. And the intent there is to, so we don't just have one really good bikeway that doesn't really connect you to anything, but to have a whole network within a neighborhood so people can actually get around within that network um, as we then move on to different parts of the city. Um, and then the other way that the city is really moving wise, strategy wise, is to leverage existing projects. So we, we pave our streets on sort of a five year cycle. Um, and so putting in bike lanes and bike infrastructure in tandem with paving um, makes it more efficient for the city and also reduces the disruption for people who live there and the construction that's happening on their street. Uh, and then to use other sort of big projects to help leverage those uh, changes as well. Uh, so I wanted to get into a little more nitty gritty of how we actually choose which of those high comfort facilities we put on any given street. Um, and that really comes down to the volumes and speeds on that street. So volumes meaning the number of vehicles that travel on it per day. Uh, and then speed, uh, both the speed limit and the actual speed that people are typically driving on that roadway. Um, and you can see from that graph, so that white area, so when we have really low volumes and really low speeds, uh, to get those one fourth mile connections, we're looking for these local small roadways as really good candidates for that neighborhood bikeway treatment. Um, but then as you move up in volume and you move up in speed of the street, we're starting to look more at buffered bikeways, that buffered bike lane. Uh, and then we move towards collectors and arterials or bigger streets like Central Park Boulevard or Martin Luther King Boulevard. And that's where we have to move towards the protected bike lane or even a separated facility to provide the level of comfort that we're hoping for people to get out on the street. So as I kind of alluded to in the beginning, we do have a limited space on the roadway uh, and we're trying to serve a lot of different users. We have our typical motorists, our single occupancy vehicles. We have our pedestrians we wanna move through safely. On some streets, we have buses and transit. Um, we're now trying to serve our cyclists better within this right of way. Um, some streets have freight. And then of course, we're seeing this more under COVID than any other time, it's like a public space for us as well. It serve a lot of functions and it's a really a balancing act to serve all of those functions on any given street. So uh, that means we had to end up prioritizing or choosing a trade-off in a lot of cases. And so when we have the rubber hitting the road, there are some choices that we're actually making. Um, and one of those is to choose safety over vehicle efficiency. And uh, one example of that specifically would be what I call a leading pedestrian interval. Uh, this is a common thing that we do at signals to give a pedestrian more time to cross the street. They get a little extra time ahead of the light turning green for traffic. But necessarily that actually means that the vehicles trying to move through get less time moving through. So there's a little less efficiency for them. Uh, another choice that we've had to make is uh, have bike lanes over parking lanes or in even some cases vehicle lanes. With limited space on the roadway, trying to build out this network, uh, if we see low parking utilization or low volumes, we might re repurpose that space for bike infrastructure. Um, and then another trade-off is that we are spending money on bike lanes and bike infrastructure and that money could go to something else. So these are real trade-offs that the city is making a decision about and they have real consequences. Um, so it's not surprising that we have seen and probably will continue to see um, some frustration with the bike program. Um, uh, in Twitter world, they tend to call it hashtag bike lash. Um, but we're seeing a, a, some, some, you know, toughness as we make those trade-off decisions um, on the roadway. Uh, it's essentially with change often comes pain. Um, I have some cool quotes up here. There's a lot of them from, you know, our eminent minds that change is important, but it also means it's difficult. I'm not telling you guys anything new here, um, but that's, that's true and something we really have to think about um, for our city and as a community and as we collectively talk about these issues in the direction we're going now. This kind of infrastructure, which has a lot of benefits, also leads to a lot of um, pain. Um, and this is a graph that we've learned from other cities that have been doing this for a while, that there's sort of what we call a political valley, um, where people generally like the idea of bike infrastructure, but it, when it comes to construction, that dotted line, and you realize that there's a trade-off in your own street, uh, there tends to be more of that dissatisfaction or disapproval. 
Um, so the city's goal overall is to uh, educate early on, help people understand what the benefits are, why we're making these trade-off decisions, um, and that helps the city overall have those conversations about where the trade-offs happen and hopefully have only a little bit of that political sort of disapproval valley. Um, so I just wanted to have one more poll. I'm getting close to the end. Um, but this is sort of a knowledge, interesting fact for you guys to know. So what do you think is the single most important factor that contributes to safety of a bicyclist in an urban area? Yep, I see the answers rolling in. Looks like wearing a helmet is the popular answer right now, not to sway anybody. What do you think is the right answer here? Driver education is coming up out top. Cool. All right, let's share those results. Hey, thanks, Lauren. So it uh, looks like wearing a helmet came out on top. Um, that's interesting. Um, it certainly feels that way a lot of the time. It's the most obvious thing that each bicyclist can do when they go out on the road. But the real answer here is other bicyclists. Um, and what I mean is that we see that in cities, the uh, incidence of crashes for bicyclists goes down the more bicyclists are on the road. Um, so it's, it's not even the infrastructure, it's not about uh, education specifically, but when people see more bicyclists, they expect more bicyclists. Um, so it's an interesting fact to think about. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem that we then see, but it also means um, that moving, you have to sort of move through a certain preposite, uh, precipice, get to a certain state where there's just a lot of bikes on the road, and that's when it feels safer for everyone and is safer for everyone. So interesting fact to think about as we plan for bikes in the city. I just have like a minute or two left here, and I really want to leave time for questions and hear thoughts, but I really wanted to just take a minute to think about what this means moving forward, and what I personally feel this is moving into my, my opinions more than the city stance. Um, but what we need to focus on moving forward on. And also, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts and I'll share a little bit of my thoughts on what COVID actually means for this moving forward. I'm sure it will change things, um, but there's some competing factors there. So just moving forward, I think there are a couple gaps the city has to invest more time and thought into. Um, and one of those is intersections. So we're really thinking a lot about that network, which is really important, um, but more and more studies are showing that specifically intersections are where incidents occur, where crashes occur. And that's not necessarily surprising. Um, but New York City is kind of the leader in this area of actually doing statistically based data collection on what infrastructure does. Um, and it shows very clearly that intersections are where it's at. So moving forward, once we have started to establish the citywide network, I think we're gonna have to really think very carefully about how we cross arterials on bikes and how to make that feel safe. And there are some good infrastructure especially from those sort of like beacons in Europe about complex intersections that really work for bicyclists, pedestrians, and vehicles. Um, but we need to start thinking about those more in depth. And the other piece of this is land use. So you can see that little sort of, uh, I don't know, circle graph at the bottom, I'll call it. Um, we have sort of a rule of thumb about how comfortable it is to go at different um, modes. So for uh, walking, we typically think a half mile is just sort of a good walk. A lot of people are willing to go that far and not go that much further than that. For biking, it's typically three miles. Um, so that's the, the radius of where you're willing to go. But in order to make that, transportation and land use are just very interlocked. So we need to think about density and where our jobs are and where our services are compared to where we live. Um, and that's a little bit why mixed use becomes very important for urban planners and why we talk about it so much. Um, and we need to think more about this um, in other parts of the city as we grow. And then I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts about this. No one really knows what's going to happen under COVID. But do you think there's some mixed changes that will help and hurt bikes? Um, one is that I think there's a lot more appreciation out there for that shared space on the road and how that is a community good and how we use that for recreation. Um, we have a lot of positive feedback towards those shared streets where we've shut them off to moving traffic. Um, on the other hand, this is very, very tough on our transit systems. I'm not sure how well they'll come through this and transit and biking are pretty linked in the scheme of things. And finally, very understandably, a lot of people are moving away from urban areas. 
Um, so that doesn't help that urban density, that land use picture doesn't really support biking as well. So I am curious how this is going to go. I think there's some interesting things that have supported bikes and our urban areas and some things that are going to really change things into the future. And I am really happy to answer questions, um, hear your comments. I know I talk really fast, but I'd love to have a discussion in our last couple minutes here. Thank you, Dana. That was, that was great. We do have some questions coming in, so let's jump to those. We just do have a uh, about, about three minutes or so for more than three questions, I suspect. But let's see. Let's start with one that Andre put out there, which is about maybe you made some reference to Europe. But uh, he says in Netherlands, where bicycles rule, people don't wear bicycle helmets. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about that and how what other things maybe we've learned from Europe compared to you know cities planned around the vehicle like here in Denver in the United States. But. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. That's yeah, that's a really good point. So uh, I think in the U.S. we tend to uh, put the onus on the bicyclist to feel safe, and in Europe they focus on the infrastructure. And in places like the Netherlands, like I mentioned, they have the just volumes of bicyclists on the road. And when people are just familiar with bicyclists being there, they're thinking about bicyclists being there. Um, the chicken and egg problem again, it does relate back to the infrastructure and also culture to some sense. So I think when I, I haven't gone there yet, but I've studied a lot about the Netherlands and again, talking about intersections, the way they do intersections is just totally different than the way we do intersections. Everyone, uh, what did I hear? I heard a uh, quote that I like. This is how their sort of rule of thumb, which is when everyone has a piece of the road, there is peace on the road. So literally on the road, there's always a space for bicyclists. It's very clear where they should be at all points. There's a very clear space that's separate for pedestrians and another clear space that's separate for vehicles. Um, and they do that really well and they carry it through intersections and they have signage. So these are things we need to think about even more, but we're starting to have that, sh that particular piece of the road or piece on the road in the city, but we have a long way to go um, to really get to where Europe is and have sort of those volumes of bicyclists on the road, which is what contributes to safety more than helmets or other sort of uh, things that you you carry on your bike. Makes sense. Okay. We have a couple questions related to commuters. Um, and I'll try to put these together. One that Alan Friedberg asks is about the B-cycle program that was in Denver. And he commutes a lot and really appreciated the use of the B-cycles uh, from transferring from the bus that he would take from Boulder. But, um, you know, what's going on with the B-cycle program? And also, you know, how many true commuters are there in Denver that use bicycles versus you know, use them more periodically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, so to answer the first question, I love to bicycle too. It's kind of a bummer. Um, there are programs like that all over the country. Um, in Denver's case, bicycle had some obligations to the city. They sort of had a contract with the city to use our space on the, um, on the sidewalk for the stations and such, and they weren't meeting those obligations. Some of those were around equity. Um, that was sort of the biggest pull point is that we weren't getting the stations to different parts of the cities, um, which are of a higher equity need. Um, so uh, the administration made sort of the tough decision to try and pull that and see if we could get a better program. Um, it, that, and that's sort of that process had been stalled. There was an RFP put out to see if um, there was someone else who could offer a better program. Bicycle re did resubmit, um, but they're sort of retooling and rethinking uh, based on those RFP, the who submitted and what applications are to, to reinstate a new program and try and meet the goals of the city a little better. So I don't know exactly where it sits right now, but I do know it's been pretty delayed um, with COVID and some other things to try and get a, a new program that really works well for the city. So hopefully in the next year or two, I think it was supposed to be this year that we'd have selection of a new, um, a new program, but I haven't heard about it yet where that stands, but hopefully we'll have something new in place with a new contract soon. Um, and then the other piece I can talk about very briefly. So I had it at the end of my um, presentation. I don't have time for it, but um, right now we sit at about 6% of the population that bikes or walks to their destination for their daily commute. So it's pretty low. It's higher than a lot of cities in the US. What's interesting for me though, is that um, people live in the sort of urban core. So that three mile radius I was talking about, that number jumps a ton. So um, it's almost 30% who use uh, bike 
walk or transit to get in um, when they're living more towards the urban core, which speaks to the importance of land use. But we have a long way to go to achieve our goals from that sort of like 6% uh, to, I think the current goal by 2030 is about 15%, so more than doubling that number. Hmm. Okay. Excellent. Well, Dana, unfortunately, I think we need to leave it there. We're at, we're at the top of the hour now, but uh, very informative. And it's great to, to get some insight into the city of Denver and how it does its planning and for us, uh, us commuters, us recreationalists and folks here and, and use of bikes. So that's, that's cool. Fun to learn about. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks, Jim. And um, I'm happy to answer questions. I didn't put out my email, I see, but uh, you can reach out to Rick and get my contact if you want to talk more. Okay. So Rick can help us get in touch with you. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, Dana, in honor of you speaking with us today, uh, our Rotary Club makes a donation to uh, end polio now or polio plus, eradicating the disease of polio in the world. And so with your speaking with, uh, to us today, in your honor, we will have 100 children when matched with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, but 100 kids that will get the, uh, the vaccine to prevent them from getting polio. So thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, let's see, a couple things to, to wrap it up. We have uh, just an announcement about next week's program. Next week, we are hearing something about personal development, personal improvement, but three presenting mistakes that can cost you sales or buy-in. Elizabeth Bachman, who's a professional, training speaking, uh, professional trainer on speaking presentation skills, I wonder if she can help benefit, you know, past presidents of Rotary as well to run better Rotary meetings with our speaking. Um, Let's finish up with our, so I hope you can join us next week. That's a regular time online with Zoom. Um, let's finish up with our four-way test, that, as we always do. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned, including bicyclists? So thank you all. We are adjourned. Mm-hmm. <laughs>